right. Full start. We're good. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. As you notice, we're doing things a little bit, a little bit different today. And uh, before we even get started, I realize I forgot the clicker back here. So let me grab that. I'd like to blame Edwin, but uh, he's a good boy. It wasn't his fault. That was just me. I forgot to grab it. How many people here know Galatians 2.20 in song form? All right, we, we got a couple that know it, and it's King James only version, right? Yeah, because you can't, you can't sing Galatians 2.20 in any version other than the King James. Like, I'm pretty sure that actually is a law somewhere. <laughs> we're going to start off with that. We're going to sing it three times. Uh, each time we're going to get a little bit faster. Now, I'm not a song leader, so anybody else who wants to help with me carry it, please do. We're going to sing it three times. So, all right, three, two, one. Oh, there's a song leader. Ready? You ready to start us? Ready? All right, ready? You want to start the song? What song? song? All right, we'll start. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Very good. Very good. You know, in vacation Bible school growing up, we would do that like seven, eight, nine times. And uh, the song leader that we had, um, he had to have practiced it because he could set like a land speed record. Well, would that be land speed? A sound speed record for how quickly he could recite that. It was like a game. Could anybody sing it faster than Bob? All right. He is the uncontested champion for how many times he can sing through that song and and get faster each time. Well, I start with that song to kind of warm us up a little bit. You see, we're continuing in our little mini-series here on the Trinity and on the nature of God. And so last week we talked about God the Father. Today we're going to talk about God the Son. And next week we're going to talk about God the Spirit. And what we're doing is we're looking at ways that each person of the Godhood relates to mankind today. And so the reason I'm down here is because today's sermon is going to be a little bit different. Uh, Today's going to be more open discussion time. As we talk about God the Son, the Messiah, and the Christ. If there's any one topic from the Bible, from our one-word series that we've been going through, that, that you, that we should already have a pretty good understanding of, it would be this one. It would be the Son of God. And so when I draft my sermon notes, I, I usually try to present lessons from Scripture in a way that might help us to think a little bit differently about the text, uh, to bring in some new insights from the greater context of it to offer, you know, some points of application. Uh, But I want to do today a little bit differently because I want more than to just share something with you. I want us to share together in the ways that Jesus has shaped your life and what it is about Jesus that is meaningful to you. Now, I have some notes and some slides prepared. I do have some content to get through, uh, but there's going to be some Q&A here. There's going to be some question time, some discussion time. And so I'm going to start us off by by asking one question that I just want to plant this seed. Hold on to it, because in a few moments will be your opportunity to answer. But here's here's the question that I want you kind kind of turning on. Can you describe Jesus to me? Who is he? Why do you follow him? Just just let that marinate for a little while. We'll come back to that. Now I have... Um, Another question for you, and this one, you know, feel free to to answer. But what does it mean for Jesus, for God the Son, to be Messiah, to be Christ? (laughs) 
seen a lot of gears turning. I know you guys have some thoughts. Yeah, that's the mission of the Christ, the Savior that was foretold. So when we we through the text, and as we sing different songs and praises to him, one of the songs that G, uh, Edwin asked to sing on our way to church this morning um, was, uh, I love the Lord Messiah. I don't know if you get deep down in my heart. Know that one? No? That's another vacation Bible school one. Uh, I won't torture you with me singing that one by myself then. But um, I love the Lord Messiah deep down in my heart. Uh, The song that we kicked off uh, here, I've been crucified with Christ. Christ, Messiah. They're They're the same word. It's just Christ is the Greek, Messiah is the Hebrew. They both mean the same thing. And that meaning is anointed. And in the most literal application, the anointed means literally to have been anointed on the head with with oil. But when it's used in in reference to certain figures in the text, the process of being considered an anointed one means that you were chosen by God for a specific purpose, a very unique role in life to accomplish God's will during your own time. And prior to Jesus, and and this this might throw some people off, there were a lot of messiahs before Jesus. There were a lot of Christs before Jesus. And see, in Leviticus, certain priests were considered the messiah as they were elevated to a special status to fulfill a special role by God in bringing sacrifices to him and leading the nation of Israel in worship. In Psalms 105, verse 15, we learn that the prophets were considered Messiah. They were anointed by God to fulfill the role of his uh, mouthpiece. They were given the task, the purpose, the duty, the calling. They were chosen to speak His words to the people. And throughout the books of Samuel and Chronicles and many of the Psalms, this language of Messiah and Christ is used to describe kings throughout Israel's history. These kings were anointed. They were chosen by God to lead and to govern and to display both justice and mercy over God's people. It's most often used in reference to David. But we also see this term of Messiah, anointed, to refer to a Gentile, a pagan king. In Isaiah 45, Isaiah gives this prophecy of a future anointed one named Cyrus, who would rescue Israel and aid in the rebuilding of the temple. Now, here's the crazy thing when Isaiah describes this guy named Cyrus. Isaiah foretells this. Isaiah describes a Cyrus's role over 150 years before he is born. And over 100 years before the temple is even destroyed. So we see the prophet Isaiah, as inspired by God, is saying that there's going to be a leader that I choose who's going to free Israel and help them rebuild the temple. And in Isaiah's day, the Jews are thinking, rebuild the temple, the temple's right here. (laughs) What do you mean this guy Cyrus? That's not a Hebrew name. What's up with that? But here's the thing. When Jesus comes, when Jesus arrives on the scene, there is a special exclusivity to this word, to an anointed Christ, Messiah. By the time of Jesus, this word only applies to him. Now, why is that? Well, as as Matt mentioned, because he was anointed by God the Father to fulfill the plan of salvation. 
to redeem the sins of the world, that all persons would have the opportunity to receive forgiveness and be reunited with God. And Jesus alone, in all of human history, fulfilled that purpose, that anointing purpose. He serves as priest, as he establishes true worship to God, and is that lone intercessor between us and God the Father. And in that way, he's the anointed priest. Jesus serves as the anointed prophet because he not only speaks the words of God, he is the living word of God who perfectly reveals and exemplifies God's will. And Jesus is the anointed king in that he alone has all authority over heaven and earth. That's God the Son, Jesus the Christ. He is the sovereign king that's been anointed by God the Father. And I want us to look at a passage dealing with this identity of Jesus. So if if you'd like to, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew 16. We're only going to read a few verses, but we're going to be here for, for a few moments. In Matthew 16, I start in verse 13. But this is the famous confession of faith from Peter. But we're going we're to back it up before Peter's words. We're going to see this question that Jesus gives to the disciples. In verse 13, Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And I'm pausing here because I'm going to ask you guys a question here in a moment, and that's going to be, who do people say Jesus is today? So I'll let you just think on that for a moment. Now back to the text. And they answered Jesus. They said, some say John the Baptist. Yeah, others say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And now I think it's so fascinating to remember the the context of where they are when Jesus chooses to answer this question. As as I've mentioned this in a a previous sermon, uh, Caesarea Philippi is a largely Gentile city. It is is an epicenter of pagan worship to all number of false gods, the chief of which for that region was the god Pan. And there's a cave there known as the Mouth of Hades. And there's also a mountain there that was worshipped by many of the Canaanites as being home of the gods. And I just find it so interesting that it's this location that Jesus chooses to go to when he asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Standing at a place where all of the pagan world recognize that this is a place where deity is revealed to the world. And so their response is, well, first... The language of son of man is an interesting question. Who is the son of man? This is language, again, that is unique to Jesus. And this comes from the book of Ezekiel and also in Daniel chapter 7, where the son of man was an Old Testament, a Jewish title to describe a future coming king and savior. A title that the Jewish people associated with only one person. And so when Jesus asks, who do others say the Son of Man is? He's asking, who do others say that I am? Because before this, he has already ascribed that title to himself. And so they say, John the Baptist, this idea was made popular by Herod Antipas. When he hears of Jesus' miracles, he thinks that John, the John who he just had beheaded, has come back to life. Because Jesus' ministry has amounted such a profound following equal to that which John had. And so Herod is a little bit fearful that God's prophet, whom he just beheaded us, came back. Now, others said that, a lot, that the Son of Man, that Savior, is going to be the prophet Elijah because of the prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, which taught that the, the spirit of Elijah would come back to the people to prepare them for the day of the Lord. So there would be a return of this great prophet when the mighty Lord would come to the people. And 
And then other rabbinic traditions said that, well, any number of Jeremiah or the great prophets could be that son of man. And so they had many answers that were being shared around of what the people said. And so there's going to be another uh, little discussion point here. Um, who do people say Jesus is today? <coughs> what does the world say about Jesus? Uh, he was a good man. Maybe a prophet. Maybe a bigot. <laughs> Maybe a heretic or a blasphemer. In Jewish tradition now, Jesus is looked to as a rabbi, but nothing more than just a teacher. In the Islamic faith, Jesus is viewed as a prophet, but nothing more than just a, a speaker for God, but certainly not a savior. In Mormonism, Jesus is not viewed as God himself. He's viewed as a created, lesser being. He's actually viewed as the brother of Satan. And most people... What's that? A peacemaker. Well, certainly, that is a great way to think about Jesus. We're going to talk about that one. A peacemaker. See, for those that believe in Jesus and understand the Bible, there are many names. But most people in the world, what they see in Jesus is nothing more than just a wise teacher at best, whose words are of, of little consequence. Certainly there's not many today who view Jesus in the same way that his own brother Jude does. And Jude verse 4, Jesus is described as both Lord and Master. That's offensive language today, as much as it was offensive language when Jude wrote that back in the first century. The title of Lord and the title of Master convey proper authority that demands our allegiance and obedience. Not many people look to Jesus as both Lord and Master in their life. So after taking in the responses of what the people say about Jesus... He then turns the question on his disciples. In verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Who do you say Jesus is? We see Peter responded correctly that he is the Christ, singular that the Jews had the proper understanding that no more were there be multiple messiahs that could describe various prophets or priests or kings, but now there would be one singular messiah, one singular Christ to rescue his people. And Peter confesses Jesus as being that savior. Peter confesses Jesus as the singular son of God. A description revealing Jesus' direct connection with the Father both in spirit and also in conduct, that Jesus was the very likeness of the Father. So Peter's response shows the great confession of Jesus' identity as it reveals the primary way in which Jesus, God the Son, relates to mankind. He is our Christ. He is the chosen one of God, anointed to justify to propitiate, to redeem, to adopt mankind from our sins and back into a right relationship with God. And we must understand that identity of Jesus to truly know who he is. However, just because that's the primary description of Jesus, the primary description of God the Son, it is far from the only one. Does anybody remember from last week how many names of God there are in the Old Testament. Over 100. And we looked at a handful of the most common ones. Anybody want to take a guess how many names for Jesus there are in the Bible? Over 100. That are different from the 100 names of God 
We'll say God proper. <laughs> Jesus has over 100 names that are used to describe him as a unique person of the Godhead. So now is going to be some discussion time. I know there's a lot of hungry people out here. So I have more notes prepared. The more you talk, the less I have to. And the less I talk, the faster we get back there. So now I'm going to turn the sermon over to you guys for a little bit, and then I'll kind of play clean up at the end. And I'll offer some more passages and scriptures. Who do you say Jesus is? I want us to share together who is Jesus. Which descriptions of Jesus can you think about in the Bible? Maybe it's your favorite passage, your favorite uh, confession of faith, your favorite parable that he gives in which he shows who he is to mankind. What are some of your favorite descriptions? If a complete and total stranger who's never heard of Jesus were to ask you, hey, tell me about this Jesus guy that you follow, what would you say to him? That was like five different ways of asking the same question. Absolute truth. Truth. Absolute truth. Yes. Care to expand? Nope. Nope. <laughs> In a world full of Oprah Winfrey's truth, it's good to know that there is a higher truth than that. I could be wrong on this, but Oprah was the one that at least in modern times popularized the idea of your truth. That idea of living your truth has, has always been around, but in modern times, she's the one that made it popular. Y you pursue your best life. You be true to yourself. Right. But what if your truth violates all of God's goodwill and intentions. There's only one truth, and that's what Jesus has revealed to us. Good. He was called teacher. Teacher! Yes! Absolutely. What does Jesus teach us? Who he was, what we're supposed to do. Yeah. He teaches us the truth. He teaches us of his own identity and how we are to come to God through him. He is the great rabbi, the great teacher. Creditor. The what? Creditor. Creditor. Oh, good one. I haven't thought of that one. Expand on that. Well, he gives us the credit in order to live with God. Yeah. He paid the debt. He paid the debt. Yes, absolutely. And that goes back to our lessons on justification and redemption. That it's through Christ that our debt's been paid off. Our sins ended up on His bill, I guess if you will. Good one. What are some others? King of Kings. King of Kings. Yes. Love that one. The Loving Shepherd. The loving shepherd. A, a living example. An example, yes. Son of, God. Son of God. Now we're rolling. Mediator. Me oh, yeah. Mediator, yes. That's a great one. Uh, many people overlook the singularity of that title for Jesus as being our intercessor, our mediator with God the Father. He's the only one between us and God the Father. There's, there's no priest, there's no prophet, there's no king, there's no religious leader that stands between us and God. It's, it's Jesus alone. Very good. Temple builder. Temple builder, yeah. You want to expand on that one? <laughs> no? <laughs> no, that's great, right? Because when Jesus is foretelling of his own death, he says that the, the temple will be destroyed and it will be rebuilt in three days. And what Jesus is teaching as the great teacher is that it is through him by which people of God will be able to come to God because that was the role of the temple. The temple to the Jews was the way to access God. So when Jesus says that he is that temple, He's saying that he is the access point. All right, good. We're, we're at like 10 out of 100. Maybe let's just get two or three more, and then I'll move on. The ultimate love guru. The, 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 <laughs> the, the love guru. Yes. 
Without him, we wouldn't know what, what that even means. What true love, yes. Uh, and you know, in, in my young and, and immature uh, understanding of, of love, uh, one of my favorite movies, Once Upon a Time, was the movie Hitch, where Will Smith plays this love doctor who he can matchmake anybody. And it is a tragically shallow understanding of love that I look back now and I'm like, this is a really dumb movie. Like, from a Christian perspective, this is absolutely an atrocious representation of how love is supposed to work. But in my youthful immaturity, I was like, man, this is a great love story. <laughs> Thankfully, I've grown beyond that. Yeah, uh, Josiah. Um, uh, like a, um, a lamb within a whole, um, like a whole thing of Kyle. Yeah, he, yeah, he's, he's the lamb of God, right? And then all the um, lions, um, Kyle, end up uh, attacking the lamb. Because yeah. Yeah, so you've got a lot of theology wrapped up in what you just said right there, right? He's the Lamb of God in that he's the sacrifice for our sins, but he's also the one who protects from the coyotes. He's the one who protects from the wolves, and that goes back to the shepherd language. And so, yeah, that's great. The great physician. The gr- oh, yeah, I've got that one. Yep, that's going to be coming up again. The real good doctor. <laughs> the, the, the re- <laughs> he's the goodest doctor there's ever been. You know, that, and that, that's something that, that distinguishes... Jesus from what you see today in these huge mega churches that talk about faith healings. And there's all these scams out there with that. And, and, and in every single one of those cases, there's never been an actual healing that's been evidentiary, evidentiarily, I think that's a word, proven, right? But when Jesus healed someone, there, there, it was immediate. It was it was publicly visible. It was knowable. You've got a a man who's been lame for his entire life who now all of a sudden gets up and walks. You've got a person who's been born blind and now he can see. You've got somebody that everyone in town knows that guy has demons in him and Jesus casts them out. Yeah. All right. We've got some great ones. We'll we'll go through just the rest of this lesson here and and we'll get to uh, to the reason that I hope that this little exercise and illustration uh, is helpful to you and hopefully what we can take away from this. And so in an expeditious manner, when we look at Jesus' own words to describe himself, we see seven, eight, depending on how you count these primary ways. These are known as the I am statements of Jesus. Now each, each one of these are important. Each one of these are unique. Each one of these is a sermon by itself because each one reveals a special way that God the Son relates to our needs in this life. Jesus says that He is the bread of life, and whoever comes to Him shall not hunger. Whoever believes in Him will not thirst. And this is, this is such an important teaching, because He gives this teaching immediately after feeding 5,000 people. Plus people. I say plus because it's a question of how women and children are counted into that number. It could have been upwards of 10,000. And after feeding this crowd of thousands, he says, if you follow me, you'll never be hungry again. Now, was Jesus saying that he's a 24-7 McDonald's? (laughs) That he's just a drive through That, hey, anytime you get the rumblies, you just drive on up. Hey, Jesus, throw me a Big Mac, large fry, milkshake. Oh, sorry, milkshake machine's down. Not with Jesus. It's always running. Right? No. And he chastised the people because that's how they thought of him. They thought he was that have-it-your-way Burger King. And he says, no. You're hungry for the wrong thing. Those that are seeking true satiation... Those that have a spiritual hunger for God, you get that filled through me. And only me. It's a challenge to be hungry for the right things. In John chapter 8, he says that he is the light of the world. Whoever follows after him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then what's amazing is immediately after, he says that he's the light of the world, he heals a blind man. 
he backs up what he says. The miracle proves the statement that Jesus provides the light to see in this dark world. But far greater than restoring a blind man's vision, he is the light to our souls. He is the light that guides our steps in this life. In a world full of lost people, he is the light of rescue. In John chapter 10, we we read the great analogy where he is both the door and the shepherd. And my understanding is during this time, the common practice was you would have the the pen or the cave or wherever the sheep were, were stored up for the night, a good shepherd would sleep in the doorway. So the shepherd literally served as that door and, and the shepherd. But we see that this teaching is Jesus revealing his exclusivity as the door. There's only one way. There's only one way to the good pasture, to the spiritual reward to the rest for the soul that David talks about in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You see, uh, this life is full of many doors, many opportunities, countless promises of a life of pleasure, but, but every other door that opens up in your life, it's empty and it's fading. There's no job, there's no house, there's no car, there's no amount of, of, of a partying lifestyle that can provide the true rest of the soul that comes from Jesus, that can provide a truly meaningful life. And Jesus is the way to access that life. But he's also not just the door, but that shepherd who protects, who governs, who watches over the flock. He lays down his life for his own. And what is the threat that the shepherd has to lay down his life? The ravening wolves it's the ways of the devil. It's the, it's the works of sin. These things that try to tempt our soul away from God. Jesus died as our good shepherd to rescue us from the snares of Satan. And in John 11, we read that he is the resurrection and the life. And he gives this teaching immediately before raising Lazarus from the dead. Once again, the miracle substantiates the teaching. If you want resurrection, you have to come to Jesus. That's it. That's the only way. He is the resurrection and the life. And in John 14, I love this one, verses 1 through 6, we read that He is the way, the truth, and the life. This teaching of the way, the truth, and the life comes right after Thomas, doubting Thomas, he asked Jesus, Jesus, how can I follow you to God the Father? Jesus just said that those who follow him will see God the Father. And Thomas says, well, how? How is that possible? And Jesus says, I'm the only way. I'm the absolute truth. I am the life. Jesus is the only way to God the Father. He is the truth in that He is the very living Word of God. And He is the life in that He not only creates life, He sustains life, and He delivers us into eternal life. In Jesus, there is no final death. And in John 15, we read Jesus describing Himself as the true vine, with His Father as the vine dresser. And this statement reveals that Jesus is our very source of life our very source of moral goodness, that it is impossible to bear good fruit without Jesus. He is the standard by which all good things come. And then the most ultimate of all in John eight fifty eight, I am, period. He is God. It's the name of God in the Old Testament, Yahweh. And Jesus says, I am. If you want to know God, you look to Jesus. Now there are many other names, and we've talked about a good handful that you all provided. Let me just go through a quick rapid fire list of some other ones I pulled out. Some of these you all have already mentioned. But we see that he is the cornerstone He is the rock. He's the head of the church. 
He's the groom of the church. He's the holy one. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the prince of peace. He's the word of God. He's the living water. He is God with us, Emmanuel. He is God's salvation, the meaning of the name Jesus, God's salvation. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is our high priest, our counselor, our redeemer, our savior, our brother, and our friend. And so we'll, we'll wrap up with just one last passage. As we consider the way that God the Son relates to us today, and, and this might seem like a strange passage to turn to, but I want to draw out an important point from this, from this section of Scripture. And, and many of you are familiar with it, as it's one of my more favorite um, passages. Certainly, it's one of my, it's one of my favorite passages, in, at least in the book of Acts. And that's Paul uh, preaching in Athens. And where, where he's at in Athens... He is at the center, he's in the area Pegasus, which was the, the, we don't really have an equivalent today, but think of it, if you were to have a government, um, like a city council building, and the city's university in the same building, that was the area Pegasus. It's where, it's where your politicians and your wisest, smartest, smarty pant dudes all gather together to debate, <laughs> And in the area of Pegasus, there were idols dedicated to many gods. Paul is, is truly in, in an epicenter of pagan worship. And we, and we read of this teaching. And, I'm, and really, it starts in 22, but for sake of time, I'm going to just start in verse 29. And, and Paul's teaching these, these Gentiles, these, these pagan worshipers of all these false gods. And he says, as, as mankind being God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of the imagination of man. And he's, all of these idols, all these statues that you have, they're nothing. They can't truly represent the one true God. In verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some were mocked, or some mocked, and others said, we'll, we'll hear you again about this. And so then Paul went out from their midst, but some decided to follow. Some joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. I share that passage as we consider the way that Jesus, the Son of God, relates to man today, because it highlights two other important roles that he fulfills, and that is judge and resurrection. And I want you to notice the way that the worldly people responded to this message of Jesus. Some mocked. Oh, Paul, you foolish, ignorant Jew, talking of a resurrection, what do you know? I'll take my life of Zeus and prostitute worship. How dare you speak of a resurrection? You're so ignorant. But some were like, hey, wait a minute, that sounds kind of interesting. You mean there's, there's life after this? You mean that there's, there's a resurrection from the dead, that there's a life beyond what we see now? I, I want to know a little bit more about what that is, Paul. And some were convicted believers in Jesus. That's the way that people are going to react to us as well when we talk about Jesus. Some might mock us. Some might be curious. Some will want Jesus in their life too. And so my encouragement here is don't let the skeptics deter your confession of Christ. They need him. See, in Jesus, God relates on a personal human level to our every true need. He is the hope to the hopeless. He is the one that strengthens and encourages those that are weak and afraid. He provides a home for the homeless. He, he's a friend to the friendless. 
He's the one that gives the path to those that are wandering and lost. He gives light to those that are darkness. He is the trustworthy truth in a world that's full of lies and deceptions. Don't believe everything you see on Instagram. It's all fake. It's all about lighting and angles, people. All right? None of that's real. That's right. He brings chaos into order. He gives a family to those who have none. He gives salvation to the lost. And as Rebecca mentioned earlier, he's the great physician and healer. He gives sight to the blind. He tells the lame to get up and walk. He's the one who ate with the tax collectors and the sinners. He's the one that showed mercy to the woman caught in adultery. Jesus met people where they were to show them the life they know. That's not all there is. There's more to life than where you are now. And if you want a different life, if you want a better life, if you want an eternal life with God, you have to come to me. And that is his clear teaching. And that is an invitation that's open to all of us. And I hope that you remember that, that the world needs Jesus. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. And I hope that not only today, but every day, you will be actively reflecting on all the ways that Jesus is in your life right now, the way that he has made a difference in who you are and how you live, but the way that he is making a difference in where you will spend eternity. And I hope that as you reflect on who Jesus is for your soul, that you will want to share that difference with others so that they might come to know Jesus too. Now, as is our tradition, we'll close with an invitation. We've talked about Jesus for the past 42 minutes. I, I'm really trying to get 40 minutes. It's like 40 minutes of my bus line, so I'm two minutes over. <laughs> but we've been talking about God the Son for 42 minutes now. And we've looked at probably close to 50 of the 100 names for Jesus in the text. And each one of them is unique and it's special. And, and one of those names might have provoked you in a way that you had never considered before. It might have awakened you to realize Jesus is everything I need and I'm not living for him. I'm not doing his will. <clears throat> that if I want him as my healer, that if I want him as my friend and as my brother, I have to first confess him as my Lord and my master. That if I want salvation, if I want the forgiveness of my sins, I have to be baptized with Christ. I have to join in his death if I want to join in his resurrection. There's no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if there's anybody here this morning that needs to encounter Jesus in any way, we ask that you would come forward now as together we stand and sing.